It was the cry as the ship went down. Every man was steady at his post. Captain and crew, when they knew the worst, saving the women and children first. The British is the cry to everyone, and the faith has proved unkind. So if you are willing, with a penny or a shilling, for a This is Beacon Park in Litchfield, and this is a statue to a great sea captain, Captain Edward John Smith, R.D. R.N.R. He wasn't born in Litchfield, he didn't live in Litchfield, he was born in Hanley, Stoke-on-Trent. This statue was erected in 1914, and the original bronze plaque, which says, Commander Edward John Smith, R.D. R.N.R., born January 27, 1850, died April 15, 1912 bequeathing to his countrymen the memory and example of a great heart, a brave life, and a heroic death. Be British. There's no mention on this original plaque of the ship which is most connected with Captain Smith, the greatest liner of its day, the biggest ship in the world, the ship that was to be his greatest and his final command. That ship was the Titanic. <laughs> When the mighty ship Titanic started from Southampton Bay, there were tears and fun goodbyes to as she proudly steamed away. But soon a last disaster came and filled all hearts with woe. Although in sorrow now we weep, we yet are proud to This is Well Street, Hanley, and this is number 51. It's changed a bit now, but on the 27th of January, 1850, is the birthplace of Edward John Smith, later captain of the Titanic. Now, I think this is incredible, and I think it's incredible for two reasons. Firstly, because this is Well Street, Hanley. It's not a Liverpool. It's not a Southampton. It's not a, a town with a famous seafaring or maritime tradition. It's a landlocked town. It's about as far away from the sea as you can possibly get. It's a town not of ships, but of clay and of coal. And I think it's incredible that a potter's son from Well Street Hanley should get it into his head, not just to go to sea, but to become captain of a transatlantic liner. The other remarkable thing about this is a little bit more subtle, but I think just as incredible. In those days, to be captain of a transatlantic liner, was as much a social position as it was a navigational position. In other words, you got to be the captain of a ship such as the Titanic, not simply by being the best navigator or sea captain, but ha by having the social savoir-faire, the nous, if you like, to deal with the international, the transatlantic, rich and famous, the millionaire set who chose to sail not so much on a certain ship, but with a certain captain. There was something about Edward Smith that these people liked. He knew how to deal with them. He knew how to make polite and fascinating conversation on the captain's table. You'd think that someone who had that sort of savoir-faire would come from an aristocratic or at least a certainly very well-to-do background. But as you can see, this is an ordinary terraced house in an ordinary terraced street in Hanley, Stoke-on-Trent. Captain Smith must have been a truly remarkable person to make his way from an ordinary house like this to the bridge of the Titanic. In other words, the transatlantic rich set, the millionaires, chose to sail with Captain Smith. And that's not bad for a lad from Well Street Hanley.
Well, the importance of Captain Smith seems to be worldwide. I mean, uh, everybody, uh, you know, the letters that I get from all over the world uh, want to know about him. Have I got a photograph of him? Everybody I know from out of this country, and whenever they come to Stoke-on-Trent, they always want to go to Litchfield to see the statue, and they ask me why there is not a statue in Stoke. This uh, telescope has always been on show in my house. And uh, from when I was a little lad, and um, asking about it, uh, he said, oh, well, I'll show you one day. And when we came to Litchfield, that's when he showed me the statue. And ever since then, I've always gone to look at the statue. Whenever I go to the Litchfield, for the, it's only five minutes, it's just off the main road, Beacon Park, I just go and have a quick look, and away I come. I should think I've looked at that statue thousands of times. We're here at Etruria Methodist Church in Stoke-on-Trent, which used to be called Etruria Wesleyan Church and Schools, uh, because here we have a photograph of Captain Smith, um, he was, for a long time, a member of this Sunday school. He came to Sunday school, and he was also uh, a member and worshipper at this church. Uh, the photograph was given, in fact, by the members of the old boys' school, because in addition to being a church and schoolroom, this schoolroom, in fact, served as the day school for the surrounding area. It was the first day school in the area, and therefore, uh, John Smith, as a young boy, would come to this school and would be taught in these rooms. When he worshipped as an adult in the church, of course, it's a church which dated back to 1805, and since that day has been virtually unchanged. As you can see, the church itself is a typical Wesleyan church of the early 19th century, with the gallery going all round and the central pulpit. This has remained intact from its uh, planning and building in 1805. And it would certainly be uh, like this in almost exactness when uh, Captain Smith did in fact worship in this church in the 90s and early years of the present century. <laughs> Captain Edward John Smith, born Well Street, Hanley, January the 27th, 1850, son of Edward Smith Potter and Catherine Smith. Educated Etruria British School and became steam hammer operator at Etruria Forge. At the age of 21, visited a friend at Liverpool and applied to join the Mercantile Marine. Outstanding career. Captain first ship at age 24. Became commander and commodore of the White Star Line. Premier Atlantic captain. 62 years of age, he was the very type of a British sea captain. Quiet, with shrewd, keen eyes beneath his shaggy brows. Strong in command, gentle in social converse. Modest as a simple seaman, brave as a lion, of unblemished honour. Though I believe he's an awful stickler for discipline, he's popular with everybody. As vessels increased in size and power, Captain Smith changed from one ship to another and bore the burden of increasing responsibility. He commanded 17 White Star Liners in succession, and he was known and loved all over the world by men and women who travelled with him. His employers had absolute faith in his skill and judgment, and his caution and strength of character, and his unswerving fidelity to duty. When anyone asks me how I can best describe my experience in nearly 40 years at sea, I merely say uneventful. Of course, there have been winter gales and storms and fog and the like, but in all my experience, I have never been in any accident of any sort worth speaking about. I have seen but one vessel in distress in all my years at sea, a brig, the crew of which was being taken off in a small boat in the charge of my third officer. I never saw a wreck and have never been wrecked, nor was I ever in any predicament that threatened to end in disaster of any sort. You see, I am not very good material for a story. Well, he seemed very large to me. I don't know whether he was, but he was very upright. And he had a beard. And, oh, he, he looked different from all the other sailors in my eyes, which indeed he was. Yes, he was very nice. Yes. I met him, I should think, about three or four times. I only remember that my father spoke to him several times and, and a couple of times I was with my father. And he took us somewhere. I don't, I'm quite sure it wasn't the bridge. But it took us somewhere which um, was where passengers didn't normally go. But I, of course, wasn't a bit interested at seven years of age. 
But he was very nice, I remember that, and he greatly admired a doll I had. He was very nice to me. Well, the telescope, uh, it's been in my family ever since I remember. My father uh, used to tell me about it. It is inscribed uh, Captain E.J. Smith, and on the rear end of it, it says the Olympic. Um, it's as it was, of course, that the leather, I put the leather on because the handpiece had gone, had worn away over the years. Uh, it was in my father's collection. His father gave it to him, and it was the personal property of uh, Captain Edward John Smith, my great uncle. Um, I've also got uh, a cigar holder that uh, another uncle of mine gave me when I started uh, collecting the personal items together. Uh, I've also got a pair of epaulets. Um, in the photographs that there are, you see of Captain Smith on the bridge. Those are similar type of epaulets, but no doubt he had several pairs. I mean, he would have a set of those in every tunic that he got. Uh, I've got uh, pocket watches as well. Um, pocket watch, two pocket watches actually that belong to Captain Smith. And uh, of all of the, them is his sextant. Um, this was in a coal house belonging to one of my uncles. He knew it was in the coal house, but didn't know where. Of course, I've had all the box cleaned up. And uh, as it was being cleaned, the initials came up on, on the box. EJS, Edward John Smith. Now, the section is complete. Uh, there's nothing missing from it, apart that it's slightly damaged. Now, the date inside is uh, 1909. Now, the bit that's damaged, it looks as if it's been dropped. Uh, there's a piece of string attached to it. Now, I've always left that string on. Uh, I don't know whether Captain Smith himself actually tied that knot on there or what ships this is sailed on. But as I say, it is complete in every way. April the 14th, 8.55 p.m. Captain Smith and Second Officer Charles Herbert Lightheller are on the bridge. There is not much wind? No, sir. It is a flat calm. A flat calm. In any case, there will be a certain amount of reflected light from the birds. No, yes. There will be a certain amount of reflected light. If you are the slightest degree doubtful, let me know. All right, sir. The light of the Titanic was settling down to the quietude of the night, and all those tired people had as perfect a sense of security as though they were going to bed in a great hotel. They had implicit faith in the safety of the ship in the vigilance of the officers, in the caution of Captain Smith, that strong, calm, genial man who now and then had strolled into the staterooms with a cheery word or two. In a way, a certain amount of wonder never leaves me, especially as I observe from the bridge a vessel plunging up and down in the trough of the sea, fighting her way through and over great waves. A man never outgrows that. April the 14th, 1912, 11.40 p.m. Crow's nest, there's ice ahead. What did you see? Iceberg right ahead. Thank you. Iceberg right ahead, sir. Hard to starboard. Full of stand. Hard to starboard. The helm is hard over, sir. And she said at ten minutes to twelve, she felt a slight bump. And she said it was just like a train pulling into the station. It just jerked. It was very slight, but she said she knew that it was this dreadful something. And she wakened my father. She wakened me, and my father said no. He wasn't going up and back again after the night before. But she literally pulled him out of bed and made him go up. And she then said, if you're going to dress me, and I, being sleepy and very naughty, said I wasn't going to be dressed. I didn't need to dress for I came back to bed. My father came back very quickly, because he could get up to the boat deck in the lift very quickly from where our cabin was. And um, he came back and he picked me up and wrapped his blanket tightly around me, as if I were a baby. And my mother said nothing to him, and I used to say to her sometimes, years after, but I can't understand why you didn't say to him, what was it? Which she certainly did not say. And she said, I didn't have to say, what was it? I didn't know what it was, but I knew it was this dreadful something that I had to live with for months. There was nothing more I could say. Mr. Murdoch, what was that? An iceberg, sir. I half a star, but it didn't reverse the engines. I was going to hard a port around it, but she was too close. I couldn't do any more. Close the emergency doors. They're already closed, sir. Go down and find the carpenter and tell him to sound the ship. I'd been in my berth about ten minutes when I felt a slight jar. But it was not sufficiently large to cause any anxiety to anyone, however nervous they may have been. 
The engines, however, stopped immediately afterwards. I went up on deck in my dressing gown, and I found only a few people there who'd come up in the same way to inquire why we had stopped. But there was no sort of anxiety in the mind of anyone. We saw through the smoking room window that a game of cards was going on, and I went in to ask if they knew anything. They'd noticed the jar a little more, and looking through the window, they had seen a huge iceberg go close by the side of the boat. They thought we'd just grazed it with a glancing blow, and they'd been to see if any damage had been done. None of us, of course, had any conception that the ship had been pierced below by part of a submerged iceberg. The game of cards was resumed, and without any thought of disaster, I returned to my cabin to read until we started again. I never saw any of the players or the onlookers again. Upon the bridge, Captain Smith sent for Thomas Andrews, the managing director of Howland and Wolf, who had built the Titanic. Mr. Andrews had been on board to sort out any teething problems on the maiden voyage. He'd been working hard with his plans and notes, change for dinner, and then returned to his stateroom for more work on his reports. He had hardly noticed the bump and knew nothing was wrong until the captain called him to the bridge. Things changed quickly. He and Captain Smith made an instant tour of the ship, hastily inspecting the damage below the waterline. She was taking water fast. The iceberg, scraping ruthlessly down the ship from the starboard bow, had cut a 300-foot gash in her side. It was like this. The Titanic had 16 watertight compartments running from side to side down the length of the ship. She could float with two, three, or even all of her first four compartments gone. But the gash down the side meant that five were flooded. If Lookout Fleet had seen the iceberg a few seconds earlier, the Titanic would have swung around it. If he had not seen it at all, they would have hit it full on and perhaps have crumpled the bows. This slight glancing blow was far more deadly, slicing open five at a stroke. The bulkhead between the fifth and sixth watertight compartments only went as high as E-deck, and as the Titanic went down at the head, the water would rise and spill over into the next compartment, and then the next, and the next. It was inevitable that the Titanic would sink. So he put his very thick coat on her and put another one on himself. And without any words at all, I mean, we went out of the cabin and into the lift and up onto the boat deck. Now, if we hadn't done that at that time, I very much doubt I'd be talking to you today because, as you know, there were less than, there was accommodation for less than 800 people in the lifeboats and she was carrying 2,200. So it was a question as who was there in time to get into one of the all too few lifeboats. Well, they weren't launched very quickly, because at first no one thought anything was going to happen. But my father went away and spoke to an officer, and he said, um, they are going to launch the lifeboats, but you'll all be back on board for breakfast. And so they launched these boats, and to my father's help, he knew a lot about the sea. And he put me in the lifeboat and told me to be good. He said to me, hold Mummy's hand. And I thought he was coming after me, but he didn't. Then it dawned on me, of course, that he wasn't coming, because I didn't see him anymore. And that collision was 10 minutes to 12, and the Titanic sank at 20 past 2. So if we had had enough lifeboats, no one would have died that night. And it would have been a nine days wonder that the ship sank on its maiden voyage. It didn't matter, nobody died, and that would have been that. And here we are all these years after, with the whole world still interested in the Titanic. Below decks in the wireless room, operators Jack Phillips and Harold Bride were manning the Marconi system. On the night of the accident, I did not even feel a shock. I was standing by Phillips, telling him to go to bed, when the captain put his head in the cabin. We've struck an iceberg, and I'm having an inspection made to tell what it's done to us. you better get ready to send out a call for assistance, but don't send it until I tell you. The captain went away, but in ten minutes, I estimate, he came back. We could hear some confusion outside, but there was not the least thing to indicate that there was any trouble. The wireless is working perfectly. Send a call for assistance. What should I send, sir? The Regulation International Call for Help. Phillips began to send the CQD. He flashed away at it. We joked while he did so. All of us made light of the disaster. We joked that way while he flashed signals for about five minutes. Then the captain came back. What are you sending? CQD, sir. The humour of the situation appealed to me. I cut in with a little remark that made us all laugh, including the captain. Send SOS, I said. It's the new call. It may be your last chance. Phillips, with a laugh, changed the signal to SOS. In the next few minutes, we picked up the first steamship, the Frankfurt. 
We gave her our position and said we'd struck an iceberg and needed assistance. The Frankfurt's operator went away to tell the captain. When he came back, we told him we were sinking by the head. And by that time, we could observe a distinct list forward. The Carpathia answered our signal. We told her our position and said we were sinking by the head. The operator went to tell his captain, and five minutes later he returned and told us the Carpathia was putting about and heading for us. Every few minutes, Phillips would send me to the captain with little messages, merely telling how the Carpathia was coming our way and giving her speed. I noticed as I came back that they were putting up the women and the children in the lifeboats. In the ship's band, conducted by Mr. Hartley, whose name will be remembered always as one of the greatest heroes of the Titanic, assembled on one of the decks, and while the boats were being lowered, played selections from operas and the latest melodies. That merry music floating out above the quiet waters under the star-spoon sky set the keynote to this great melody of spiritual devotion to honor and duty. And let us look now at some of the single figures in this deadly drama. Colonel Astor, the American millionaire, was returning from his honeymoon. He'd given a helping hand with the boats and had spoken words of courage and good cheer to those who seemed frightened. Then he stood for a moment by the side of his beautiful bride. I heard Colonel Astor tell his wife that he would meet her in New York. They exchanged an affectionate farewell, but no more affectionate than that of a couple just separating for a week instead of eternity. As the boats with the women went away from the side of the ship, Colonel Astor stood for a moment at the salute. He called out a last farewell to his wife. Goodbye, dearie. I will join you later. Then he turned calmly and lit a cigarette, and leaned over the rails, staring through the darkness. Major Buck, President Taft's aide-de-camp, had been close to Colonel Astor and had behaved with the chivalry and the quiet, cheerful courage of a gallant gentleman. He was very calm. He gave his orders coolly and pacified men who were inclined to be panicky. I last saw him by the rail looking into the water. Miss Young. I was on the last boat that put off from the Titanic. I knew Major Buck in Washington and we resumed our acquaintance on the Titanic. He was so cool and collected that he inspired all who came in contact with him with courage. He helped me to my seat in the lifeboat as coolly as if he were handing me to a chair in a drawing room. And when the boat was lowered, he stood on the deck and taking off his hat said, Goodbye. And smilingly waved his hand to me. He stood upon that watery deck as our boat pulled off. And the very last I saw of this brave man was while he stood there waving his hat and smiling. One of the stewards who was instrumental in getting the people away in the boat says that Mr. Benjamin Guggenheim, the New York banker, was offered a place in one of the lifeboats, but he refused, saying, I will not go. No woman shall remain unsaved because I was a coward. Mr. Guggenheim gave the steward a message for his wife, which was afterwards delivered. If I don't turn up, tell my wife that I have done the best I could. He was one of those who went down. But he and a friend found time to return to their cabins and put on evening dress. When the steward expressed his amazement, Mr. Guggenheim smiled and said, If we have to die, we will die like gentlemen. The men all stood away and waited in absolute silence, some leaning against the end railings of the deck, others pacing slowly up and down. The boats were then swung out and lowered from A deck. When they were level with B deck, where all the women were collected, the women got in quietly, with the exception of some who refused to leave their husbands. In some cases, they were torn from their husbands and pushed into the boats, but in many instances, they were allowed to remain, since there was no one to insist that they should go. Looking over the side, one saw the boats from aft already in the water, slipping quietly away into the darkness. Presently, the boats near me were lowered, with much creaking as the new ropes slipped through the pulleys and blocks down the 90 feet which separated them from the water. An officer in uniform came up as one boat went down and shouted out, When you're afloat, row round to the companion ladder and stand by the other boats for orders. Aye, aye, sir. But I don't think any boat was able to obey the order. When they were afloat and had their oars at work, the condition of the rapidly settling liner was much more apparent. In common prudence, the sailors saw that they could do nothing but row from the sinking ship, and so save at any rate some lives. They no doubt anticipated that the suction from such an enormous vessel would be more than usually dangerous to the crowded boat, which was mostly filled with women. And we rowed away uh, from the ship as fast as we could, because one has to do that, because I believe the suction when a vessel goes down is just enormous. And we rowed away, and I didn't close my eyes at all. I saw that ship sink. And I saw that ship break in half. And for so many years, people had argued with me about that. But now at last, it has been proven beyond all doubt that she did break in half. I know she did. I saw her. And the fore part went down, nose first, and the other. The star of that ship stood up in the water for quite a long time, or it seemed a long time to me, and then keeled over. As the Titanic slipped slowly and remorselessly into the ocean, 
The Leyland liner Californian was standing quietly 10 miles away. She was blocked in by the ice and had been stopped since the Titanic arrived. Like the Titanic, the Californian was a passenger ship, but unlike the Titanic, she was only 6,000 tons and wasn't even carrying any passengers at the time. By 11.30, the Californian's wireless operator, Cyril Evans, was exhausted. He shut up his set for the night and flopped onto his bunk to flip through a magazine before finally turning in. Back on the bridge, apprentice James Gibson was intrigued by some lights out to sea. They hadn't moved for over an hour. Were they sending Morse? He tried to reply, but soon gave up. Second officer Stone was up on the bridge too. It was strange, he thought, that a ship should send up rockets at night. Stone and Gibson counted five up to 12.55. Gibson tried the lamp again, but again he gave up. Raising his glasses, he spotted a sixth rocket burst into the sky. Second officer Stone whistled down the speaking tube to Captain Stanley Lord, who was sleeping in his uniform in the chart room. Stone told him about the rockets. Are they company signal? I don't know, but they appear to me to be white rockets. The captain told him to go on Morsey. A while later, Stone passed the glasses to Gibson. Have a look at her now. She looks very queer out of the water. Her lights look queer. A little later... A ship is not going to fire rockets at sea for nothing. Call the captain and tell him that the ship is disappearing in the southwest and that she has fired altogether eight rockets. Gibson hurried down to the chart room where Captain Lord was asleep on a couch. He told him what they had seen. Were they all white rockets? Yes. What time is it? Five minutes past two by the wheelhouse clock. Captain Lord rolled over and went back to sleep. By 20 minutes to three, the lights had gone. And of course, uh, there are still... Um threats of legal things even these days about whether the ship that was so close to us was the Californian or not. I mean, I saw that ship terribly close. Now, that, the sort of thing that I must emphasize is people say, say this, say that, say the other. Now, now asking me, was that the Californian you saw? I cannot possibly tell you. I've always been told with Board of Trade inquiries and everything that went that that was the Californian. But I, Eva Hart, can't make that statement, but I don't know. I mean, short of going out to the ship and looking at the name on it, I thought, you wouldn't know. I can't think that the two big inquiries, one in America and one here, that they held at the time, would have, would have been on about that. But they're trying to say now, of course, it was, so it was a no. But I refuse to say that it was. I don't think. And the other thing I'm saying is that I didn't see a ship 19 miles away. I saw a ship that was so close, and they said at the time it was less than nine miles away. Now they're trying to say it was 19. Um, I saw it, you know, it wasn't just lights on the horizon, you could see it was a ship. And I saw our rockets being fired, which that ship must have seen. Well, this inquiry says that they did see it, so they didn't think it was a portent of danger, but I would have thought in the middle of the Atlantic, in the middle of the night, that rockets must mean trouble. And the band played on. The Titanic's musicians have become as great a part of the story as the iceberg itself. History depicts them up on the deck, playing on with heroic dignity as the waters finally closed around the doomed liner. Wallace Hartley assembled his men in the first class lounge and struck up a little ragtime. And as the great ship slipped still deeper and deeper into the water, the eight musicians moved out onto the boat deck and played on louder into the starry night. People streamed out and on to the few remaining lifeboats, and with a rise of terror and emotion, Hartley and his men kept firmly to the steady ragtime beat. Then, with just five minutes to go, Wallace Hartley tapped his violin. The ragtime stopped, and the Episcopalian hymn, Autumn, rang out into the ice-cold night. But legend has it that Hartley and his men concluded with Nero, my God, to thee. Newspapers and magazines published the words and music, surrounded by solemn portraits of the brave musicians themselves. It looked and sounded right. Some of the survivors were sure it was the case, despite two different settings of the hymn, reproduced with equal confidence. Well, there's no question about the fact that they played 
And there's no question about the fact that after we were down on the water and they were playing, they played one um, version of the hymn, Nearer My God to Thee, of which there are three. I've had this out so many times. And the one they played was the one that was played in church some months after when I was with my grandmother. And I was so frightened, I came out of church, I ran out, I knew the tune so well. But they won't have it, the Americans won't have it. They say, no, no, it's not a good it's just very fun, it wasn't. But we were down on the ocean by then. Oh, yes, I, I could do it. I, I could. I've a recollection of being absolutely petrified on a dark night with a sinking ship and people screaming. There wasn't any panic until the lifeboats left, and then there was panic galore. We were down on the ocean. We could hear them running about on the decks and screaming. You can imagine people came up from their cabin, went onto the deck, no lifeboat, tearing around the other side. That's when the panic was there. There wasn't any panic at the time I got on the lifeboat because there weren't enough people up there. And were there enough people there to just get into the lifeboat? But after that, then the others started coming up from their cabins and there were no boats. Gosh, there was panic. You could hear it. Certainly. But the most dreadful sound of all is the sound of people drowning. The screams. It's absolutely ghastly. My mother used to say sometimes, she couldn't get me to talk about it for years, but if ever I did anyone did talk to me, I said that, she used to say, yes. But do you remember the silence that followed it? And that's quite right. It was the whole world stood still that night. Once the lights were gone, the ship was gone, the town was gone. Oh, it's just, it's just. I can only tell you that I'm a terrible coward. And I never look, look at pictures of it going down, ever. When I get various books and things, I quick turn that page over very quickly. In fact, if you look through some of my Titanic books, you'll probably find a piece of paper slotted in that page, but I can't bear to look at it. It was an empty, I suppose it was a microcosm, is that the word? looking at it from low down on the sea, it was dreadful. I don't like looking at pictures of, of ships at all. I don't like pictures of the Titanic particularly because I can see it happening, you know. Which brings us to the death of Captain Smith. Once again, the facts are not clear, and we are left with the legends. But even the legends do not agree. 3.11 a.m. Reuters telegram. Suicide of Titanic captain. New York, April 18. Titanic survivors state that the captain of the Titanic shot himself on the bridge. Reuter. Captain Smith stood on the bridge, a calm, grave figure, conscious that the end was near. Two words came down from him to the people who were crowding forward. Be British. It was a call to the old traditions of our race and manhood. I saw Captain Smith alongside a raft. There's the skipper, I yelled. Give him a hand. They did, but he shook himself free and shouted to us. Goodbye, boys. I'm going to follow the ship. That was the last we saw of our skipper. I saw him swim back onto the sinking ship. He went down with it in my sight. The captain's last act was to save a little child. Soon after Mr. Williams had been hauled into the boat, Captain Smith swam up to it, supporting a baby in his left arm and swimming with his right. Take the child! He gasped. A dozen hands reached forth to grasp the baby, which was taken into the boat. Then they tried to pull the captain into the boat, but he refused. What became of Murdoch? He asked. Someone answered that he was dead. The captain released his grasp of the gunwale and slowly sank before our eyes. Someone somewhere has vouched for each of these myths, but which, if any, is nearest the truth, we will never really know.
At 3.30 a.m., the rockets of the Cunard liner Carpathia were sighted by the survivors in the lifeboats. After picking up Jack Phillips' distress call, the 12,000 tonner immediately about turned and raced 58 miles from the south to the Titanic's last radioed position. Her usual speed was 14 knots, but that night she did 17. The Carpathia arrived with the door. And uh, we were picked up, as you know, in the morning by this little ship, the Carpathia. And the rescue uh, of people from lifeboats in mid-ocean is quite a terrifying thing. These little boats, shall we say, draw up alongside, for want of a better expression, to what looks like an enormous vessel. She was quite a small vessel, the Carpathia, but she looked big from that. And then how do you get on board? You don't have a gangplank like you do when you're ashore. And so they opened a, a, a sort of, I don't know whether the word is right, a hatch in the side of the ship where the luggage used to be laid. And um, they threw down rope ladders and people like my mother and other grown-ups had to climb up in mid-ocean up a swaying rope ladder, which she said was the most terrifying thing. A sailor behind sort of holding on. And then uh, what can the children do? We couldn't climb up a rope ladder. So they got these big luggage nets and the mesh is very wide across. It's quite a big mesh. Children would have slipped through it. It's not anyway, our legs and feet would have gone So each child was put in a sack. And I remember being petrified when I was put in that sack and it was tied around and the sack full of these children were put into these huge nets and quite safely, of course, all the board. But that really was quite terrible. And having got on board, of course, I couldn't find my mother. And I didn't find her for hours, eventually. And I'm quite sure one of the most pathetic things must have been the whole of the next day, how these poor women, such as my mother, my mother roamed about the ship looking to see if they could see the husband they left behind. But no one found the husband. Of the 2,206 passengers and crew, 703 survived. A total of 1,503 were lost. The Carpathia, with its tragic cargo, steamed to New York, and the legend of the Titanic became public property. New line of Titanic, it's an iceberg. Wreck of the Titanic. How the Titanic went down. That's the story of the Titanic. And uh, we just went to New York in this little ship, and then my mother's first words were when she landed, how soon can I go home? Back Lists of the Titanic's lost and saved were eventually posted outside the White Star Line's offices at Southampton. The dead were revered at a grand and solemn memorial service at St Paul's Cathedral. Can you imagine what would have happened if the Titanic had gone down today? Can you imagine the outrage and the media furor that would have gone up? There would have been accusations, there would have been finger pointing, there would have been litigation on an international, practically a cosmic scale, wanting to know who was to blame and how did it happen. But in 1912, things were very different. Yes, of course there were inquiries. There was an inquiry in America and there was another one back in the United Kingdom. People, of course, did want to know what happened. But the media concentrated not so much on the loss of life and the responsibility. They focused on something different. They were concerned with how the Anglo-Saxon races, and the British in particular, had borne up and maintained the stiff upper lip. The British knew how to die. And that's why whenever today you look at any memorial to Captain Smith, you look at any popular media coverage of the sinking and aftermath of the Titanic, what they concentrate on is not blame, is not upon death, and it's not upon responsibility. 
what they focus upon is the dying words of Captain Edward John Smith of the Titanic. Be British. There was no borough council move for any kind of monument to Captain Smith in Stoke, and it was left to a friend, William Hampton, to raise money for a plaque which was sited in Hanley Town Hall. As for the statue, Bishop Boyd Carter raised an appeal and commissioned Lady Kathleen Scott, wife of Robert Falcon Scott, Scott of the Antarctic, who had also died in 1912, to make the statue. It was unveiled in Litchfield in 1914. Litchfield was chosen because it was seen to be more accessible and more convenient and Stoke had already had its plaque in the town hall. The unveiling took place on a lovely summer's day on July 29th, 1914. Present were Lady Scott, Millicent, Duchess of Sutherland, Helen Smith, the captain's daughter, and Mrs. Eleanor Smith, the captain's widow. The Duchess of Sutherland gave an emotional speech. We all pass through this world partly masked, partly misjudged. It seems as if our real temptations, capabilities and qualities are unknown to so many until at last, in face of some crucial situation in life, at the command of our unbearing taskmaster, death, we are truly revealed and our characters stand as they should stand. Do not read too much that Captain Smith lies in the mysterious sea which has swallowed silently many of the great, many of those we love, many of our darling dead. My friends, let us take great heart in this solemn scene and renew our courage, our own powers of self-sacrifice more strongly. For there hang over us menacing clouds that may call for our courage and powers of self-sacrifice. Let us see to it that we may never be lacking in that supreme hour. I ask Miss Smith, if she will now unveil the statue. Notably absent from the proceedings were members of the South Staffordshire Regiment, who should have been here, but were called away on military maneuvers. For within a week of the unveiling of a statue to the captain of the so-called unsinkable Titanic, the Great War, the so-called war to end wars, was to begin. I should think I've looked at that statue thousands of times. Just a feeling of nostalgia. I just look at that and think, you know, there's a man who I would have loved to have met. Of course, my age and his age, that wouldn't have been possible. <laughs> I entirely agree with my dear Dr. Ballard's words. He said the whole thing was a tribute to man's arrogance. And I agree with that. The man can be so arrogant as to build something and claim that it is undestroyable, if you like. This is the most arrogant. True, if the Titanic had struck rocks or a tempest and storm and sunk, that would be one thing. But this was a ship that needn't have not had any loss of life. Because I'm quite sure that it's not too big a statement to make to say that it is the one disaster for which there was no excuse for anyone to die. No one should have died. Had she had enough lifeboats for two and a half hours and a very smooth sea, nobody would have died. And one life is worth more than the whole ship. That is what I saw. That is what I remember. And there are hardly any of us now to share this memory. Of course. I'm the only living survivor now that can remember it and um, get about, so to speak. I don't think there's anyone that can really tell the whole story of it. Except myself. <laughs> Was the cry as the ship went down. Every man was petty at his post. Captain and crew, when they knew the war, saving the women and children of The British is the cry to everyone, and the faith has approved and Oh, you are willing with a penny or 